Hey, this is Nathan Drake from Uncharted. And you're listening to Raw Dogs. Sick Parvis Magna. Enjoy. <laughs> Very good to hold the Game Boy. I if only so, they could make the Joy Cons feel like that. Yeah, I um, was looking at getting a new Game Boy, well, a new uh, old Game Boy because mine doesn't work, and uh, the refurbished working one was eighty dollars. But hello, everybody, and welcome to Raw Dogs, your favorite podcast about video games and beer. And I'm obsessed with fucking Tetris. <laughs> <laughs> Brad and Tetris sitting in a tree. My name is Brad. <laughs> We're Part of the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Check out all the other amazing shows. Oh. Who else is here today? Uh, Dylan's here, and I'm ready to talk some uh, Alexei Pajitnov. God, what a guy. What a guy. Uh, I'm Tyler. I'm also here. I'm present. I'm ready to learn about this guy because I know so, nothing. You know nothing? I know nothing. That's interesting. That was so going to be my opening question is how much do you guys know about the history of Tetris? I know nothing. I know everything I've absorbed from other places. Uh I actually deliberately did not really research for this, as per usual. <laughs> but uh, this was one though where I, I wanted a bit okay. of a. I wanted a bit of like I wanted you to tell me a story. You know, it's yeah. story time. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, uh, Tetris is a game that everyone, everybody knows about. It's yeah. almost as pervasive, if not more pervasive, than Mario, at least in some parts of the world. Uh, it, yeah, it has to be. I mean, it was. The pack-in on one of the best-selling systems in the entire world. Yeah. Uh, opening fact, it is the second best-selling video game franchise of all time. Yep. That makes sense. It has uh, to be. It's been around since the dawn of time. But when we start talking about great gamers in history today, and it's not just Alexei Pajitnov, we're also going to be talking a lot about Hank Rogers, who you'll learn about. But... Uh, we have to start talking about the USSR as uh, all great espionage thrillers start. Naturally, I thought with the history of Tetris, how can you tell the story without a little bit of espionage? That was the first yeah. thing I thought. Well, uh, before we get there, I just want to mention this book is where I did almost all of my research. It's called The Tetris Effect, not to be confused with the game Tetris Effect, which is also great. But this book is by Dan Ackerman and highly recommend it. I have a feeling... Uh, like I watched the the upcoming trailer, the, the movie for the upcoming or the trailer for the upcoming movie, and I could pick out like everything in the in the trailer because oh really from reading the book, except they're going straight up kind of almost bi biopic. It is not about um, uh, the narrative of Tetris. It is the the history of Tetris because oh, well, there's yeah. not really much of a story. But uh, yes, the USSR was a transcontinental country spanning most of northern Eurasia. Existed from 1922 to 1991. These uh, this is something we do have to talk about a little bit, uh, just to know the context of where the story is taking place. And yeah, flagship communist state. Uh, late 1980s, uh, they started opening up the Iron Curtain a little bit. Because their country was not doing well, very poor, very in the dumps. Still isn't. Probably worse, I would argue. Yeah. But. And by that, I mean Russia, obviously. The USSR doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. But. Yeah. The, the, um, the Iron Curtain, uh, they didn't let people in. They didn't let things get out. They nope. kept their secrets. And uh, behind closed doors, it was not the the happy stories that they were telling the world that it was no. living in the USSR. Uh, but it was a period of glasnost, glasnost, which I hadn't heard since high school uh, history uh, class, world history. Glasnost was a period of openness where they were starting to let things in because they wanted money. So they're like, we have, we want that foreign money. We're going to start uh, potentially letting some things in, but you know, Russia, USSR, they weren't known for video games. They weren't known for cultural exports at all. The Bolshoi was a really nice theater. They had their things they were known for, but video games. Their funeral dirges, their awful, scary-looking cartoons. Uh, their, their propaganda <laughs> machine, also <coughs> hockey. Also hockey. Um, dudes that drink vodka that look like tanks. Named tank, probably. Now they Their all, funny palaces. <laughs> yeah. 
That's all we know. That's all we know. <laughs> They're Yushankas. I have a Yushanka. Is, oh, really? is that how you say it? Is that one of those hats? It's one of the cool hats with the flappy ear things. Oh, I like yeah, those. I've so never heard Yushanka before. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm using that word correctly, and I don't care enough to look it up. I'm just going to say you're right. Yeah, thank you, Don. Mm-hmm. And before we meet Alexi, we're going to talk about the beer we're drinking today. This is the last beer sent to us from Ryan. Oh, no. Uh, for now, Ryan, I'm sure you're up to something. Somewhere down the line, we will get you beer somehow. <laughs> but today we're drinking Project Mayhem from Martin House Brewing. It's a whiskey barrel aged peanut butter golden stout. 12.2%. Holy shit. Imperial golden stout was aged three to five months in whiskey barrels. Love it. So my hair of the dog is just a whole ass dog this morning. Man. Yeah. Uh, at least, I mean, if we wanted to do this proper, we'd be drinking vodka. Mm. Damn it. I knew I was missing something. <laughs> That wow. is delightful. That is a delicious peanut buttery beer. It doesn't that, taste like 12.2%, so it's dangerous. I taste it. I, I taste it on the back end, actually. A little burn? Yeah. yeah the there's, peanut, a, there's a bit of a stinger. Yeah, there's the a peanut stinger. butter almost hides it perfectly. Almost, yeah. So, but that's, that, that's really that nice. That is delightful. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic beer, and we, we love you for it, Ryan. I'm becoming slowly obsessed with peanut butter uh, beers, anything. Like peanut butter, honey, golden ale is uh, this beer. It's called Honey's Honey's or something like that. Fantastic. Wow. Is it the new uh, uh, lactose beer? It might be. Like the peanut butter porter you brought that one time? Mm-hmm. Fantastic. That ruled. But it'll take... Once you have one beer that's got too much peanut butter, it'll ruin it for you for a while. Don't tell okay. me that. They're, they do exist. They're rare. Uh, oh, don't tell me that. Yeah, because I generally like really sweet I've been riding stouts, this but... high for a couple couple months now. And it's nice for hangovers to sip on a really strong, like, dark beer first before drinking in a high life. Yeah. Damn, you guys went out and partied. I didn't do shit last night. Did so much <clears throat> party as I just drank, like, a thousand beers over the course of about six hours. That makes sense, though. Nate got on top of a table <laughs> and did a yoga pose. That seems very Nate. Yeah. And I was like, "How? Well, I'm, why am I surprised right now? But I should have expected this. Yeah. Um, People call me crazy. <laughs> Alexei Pajitnov, one of the heroes of our story, was born April 16th, 1955. He was born to two writers. In 1967, at the age of 11, his parents divorced. He was somewhat of a math prodigy, very gifted, And his mother was a writer specializing in cinema. So one thing that was very unique to his upbringing is it was very hard to see foreign films in the Soviet Union. They didn't want you seeing what it was like outside of there. But since his mother wrote for like a critique for cinema, when there would be an international film festival, he got to go as a kid and go see all of these amazing films that most everybody didn't get to see, which was very formative for him. It's uh, good to see the world outside behind the Iron Curtain. He had a rare ability to glimpse some of it. And, uh, yeah, he liked board games because I don't know what you do when you're tw- like a kid in the USSR. You play with a uh, In the 60s. Stick. In the 60s, too. Yeah. And in a one-bedroom <laughs> apartment that was owned by the government that you live in with your mom. I yeah. think you just crush vodka. <laughs> you just crush vodka and you dream of a better world. Well, yeah. you're 10 now. It's not time, <laughs> time for your first it. drink. <laughs> and you should probably get a job because we're broke. Yeah. We should look at those statistics. How many people start when they start <laughs> drinking in, yeah. in Russia <laughs> versus Wisconsin. Um, if that, that would be a challenge. Well, my first time getting drunk, I was 12. Wow. I was uh, 15. Okay. I was 15 ish, maybe 16. Oh yeah. I, I was, I was out camping and, uh, like like an RV park, you can't really call that camping, but uh, yeah, they just. I had, agree. They you had those. They had those delightful little Smirnoff ices, and I took eight to the dome in oh one night God, when I was twelve. Year 12 year? Yeah, it was tasty. It and tasted you, like juice. And you've never turned back since. Yeah, you know, I've quit every once in a while. Yeah, <clears throat> sometimes in the morning. Sometimes. So, th- there was one game that he liked to play called Pentamino. And pentamino was essentially, it would be like a board, like a square or rectangle, and you had a certain number of these shapes, and you had to fill in uh, the board without leaving any empty spots. Wasn't that just a puzzle? It just sounds like Tetris. Pentamino is, there's five squares for the shape, so Tetris has tetraminos, which are four. Yeah. And pentamino had five, and, you know, it... 
it is like a puzzle, but it's uh, about the unique shapes. Yeah, it's, they're not a scry- There's different ways to skin a cat, if you were. Yep. And it was very much like the unique yeah. geometry. And, that sounds fun, actually. And it sounds like Tetris, but this was just a flat board, and you filled it up. And then you'd have, like, different – some some of them you'd have, like, different uh, pieces. There'd be uh, different ways to fill the board up. And that was an important game for our story. Uh, the game originated back in the early 1900s. It cost one ruble. I have no context for what that means, but I imagine it was cheap. Yeah. I mean, the ruble couldn't have been doing good, right? Internally, maybe. Yeah. Well, this time, you know, in the USSR, it was like bread lines, poverty. People were very hungry. That's yeah. actually been most of the history of the USSR. There was really not a lot of prosperous periods. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not a history buff enough to know. I mean, it, yeah. My, but cool looking buildings, am I right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice little I would top. never want to go to Russia, ever. <laughs> and at the time, if you wanted to go to a restaurant, it required 24 hours notice and a reservation. And from everything I read in this book, every restaurant that they went to was fucking bad. Uh yeah, it was... Well, that's because literally everybody is drunk off their ass on vodka. So the cooks are drunk. The hostesses are drunk. They needed 24 hours to sober up. And they're like, we should probably hit <laughs> the grocery store and buy some food. We I, read, <laughs> I read somewhere that like... The grocery stores were empty too. Like there wasn't, wasn't even possible to get lots of food. It was hard to get anything. Restaurants were unpredictable. And yes... Every time they talk about people got together, they just drank vodka. And it's not like you can even own a, a farmstead because at a certain point, you're just in Siberia. Yeah, I, and the government also owns it. <laughs> like you could get some goats and a couple chickens and a cow, and then you, that's probably the way to do it back then because then you could just be self-sufficient out on your own. Well, not, I, that's not enough to be to produce for one human. Nobody no. was prospering that much. No. Outside of if you had the very right high up position, you were probably a little more well off. But most people, uh, communism. And uh, so Pentamino, yeah, I mentioned five squares, Tetris is four. And so that was Alexei Pagetnov's early life. He liked math. He liked these games. And During the space race, the Soviet Union was very motivated to indoctrinate youths into science and engineering jobs. Alexei was one of them. And in 1980, he, after getting a degree, he became a computer researcher under the promise of working with the latest technology. So he mostly, like, he took this job specifically to see new computers. Sure. And the computers that they were working with were, like, what middle schoolers in America were using. Extremely outdated computers, but... It was exciting. You were able to see new technology. He was working on speech recognition and artificial intelligence. Uh, Eventually, he would have his own tabletop computer, and that was very exciting. Uh, Video games still managed to sneak through the Iron Curtain. You were able to go to some spots and see, like, Pac-Man and Qbert. They were rare, but you were able to glimpse this other side of... Sounds like Saudi Arabia. Uh, I have a friend who grew like sp- spent two years of his life there and like Pokemon and all that stuff was like black market dealing. Now that is some black market dealing I'm down for. Yeah, me too. And he was just saying like, yeah, I didn't play Pokemon until way later because just didn't have it there. Well, and you, I remember just hearing Dom's story about living in China and just finding like bootleg consoles and it's a different world. Mm-hmm. But... His friend at the Academy of Computer and Science, he was able to decipher the game's programming for Pac-Man and like reverse engineer it. Very, you know, very basic version. Rudimentary, yeah. But that's kind of what you do when you want to get into development. You would Mm -hmm. see something you like and try and, you know, figure out how to reverse engineer it. So Alexi decided to program Pentominos on his outdated computer. So his computer, though, of course, no artistic flair, no ability to do Anything pretty looking, uh, you had to use just, uh, you know, the uh, uh, punctuation marks for squares is how you would make them. And <laughs> he created what he called genetic engineering, was coded in six days. The batomino shapes were cut down to four squares, and he called them tetrominoes. Some people say tetramino. I don't like that as much. It doesn't matter. I've actually much. adjusted my uh, language. I actually do pronounce it the correct way now. 
Well, I don't know if I'm saying it the correct way. It stuck with me, though. It sounds better. It sounds more official. Tetramino sounds like a biological. That sounds like a Pokemon. Yeah. Related to Porygon or something. Yeah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> That'd be fucking cool, dude. <laughs> <laughs> he needs another evolution, guys. So he essentially made pentominoes on the computer, and he kind of realized, wow, this isn't too fun. It's compared to just playing in the real world. Mm -hmm. You're playing, um, you know, there's no high scores. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. But he was able to create it. So he decided to cut the game field down to a narrow rectangle, and the shapes would drop down. And uh, the game ended too quickly, though, because it wasn't clearing the lines at the bottom yet. But that breakthrough of completed lines disappearing, making the game go on as long as it could, uh, came shortly afterwards. And the back and forth of the player in the falling blocks reminded him of tennis. He loved tennis, Alexi. So tennis plus tes uh, tetromino equals Tetris. Interesting. Yep. So Tetris, Tetris's name was influenced by the game of tennis. Yep. And the Greek word for four, tetra. That's awesome. I didn't know that. This is like a history lesson, and I love it. He smiles. I, He's I'm all smiling. smiles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is I cool. like learning new things, and history is easily my favorite subject throughout all of school. So this is like exactly what hungover Tyler needed in the morning. And stra Quick. strap yourselves in. There are going to be bad guys, uh, shady deals, and dickheads coming down the line. We're, cool. We this haven't is even gotten start. to the espionage, and I'm smiling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the prototype was completed June 6th, 1984. And very quickly, because uh, he was doing this at work on his free time, which sketchy. Um, you don't want to get caught doing that in America at a, your job at Taco Bell, let alone working for the USSR. You know, and I don't know. I used to get a, do it if you can. You're not when paid I, enough. When I worked at Southwest, do whatever you gotta. Uh, you would have a lot of time in between your flights, so I would write. Yeah, I would write oh, yeah. screenplays and stuff. And then I never looked it up, but I was always nervous. I was like, what if I wrote this on company time? Does it belong to the company then? Could they sue me for it? Because technically I should be doing something no. else. But there's not really anything else you can do in between flights. Most people just watch TV in the break room. There, there were, though, at this time when you were working there, anything that you were creating on the clock at this place did belong. Um, oh. Well, it didn't you know super legally belong to them but, but they could you it. you really weren't going to try and argue yeah but yeah the prototype was completed and other students and researchers would just gather around and became obsessed very quickly at whatever the fuck alexi just made and well think about seeing your first fucking like video game you would i'm sure that was a mind blower i'm sure they had other video game things it's 84 yeah, there were other people, like one of his uh, co-workers would be making like little video games on there as well. Like they were playing the Pac-Man one that like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Tetris, though, was mesmerizing to people. The simple act of the falling blocks and the completing the lines, it, uh, it rewards you and then immediately gives you another task. It's and, a dopamine cycle. And we're going to talk a little bit about the psychology of Tetris later. Yeah. Because there is a lot of interesting studies about PTSD, about the way your brain codes memories, a lot of cool stuff. But so people are obsessed all around the office. At the time, there were no scoring, no sounds, black and green screen, little punctuation mark squares, and people fucking loved it. And the problem is the Electronica 60 computer was very rare and uh, that's what he was making it on. There was no functional way of sharing this game in Russia, let alone they weren't dreaming about where it would go later. So his friend introduced him to a 16-year-old wonderkind named Vladimir Gerasimov. This kid was just given a tour of the place, and he was very good at programming. He, His high school teacher introduced him there, and they, Pajitnov and his buddies saw that this kid had abilities, so they first had him program another game for like take this game and put it on another computer and he did it well so Pajitnov said all right I trust this kid you want to see Tetris and so this kid Vadim Gerasimov uh, he made it work on MS-DOS systems he was the one who added colors different colors to the blocks because it was on a different computer that could handle them Ooh. 
And um, and now the game that people are mesmerized over looks prettier. It looks prettier, and now it's also functioning on a computer where you want a copy of this, and you're able to share it with friends. A little Ooh. floppy disk, send it around. So the marketability, they were already thinking, like, what are we going to do with this thing? Um, they realized it probably needed to be pretty flashy because otherwise the game is fucking blocks. It is just blocks falling down a screen. Do you think Tom was there? <laughs> he Tom shows up in two years. Okay. Yep. Right. Uh, this old man walked in. His name was Tom Wagner. <laughs> <laughs> he said, wow. I'm just picturing everyone like gathered around. He's like, hey, guys, how's it going? Ooh, what's this? <laughs> <laughs> Don't mind if I do. <laughs> uh, and his buddy Pavlovsky added a data table that would record and present high scores and that's that's kind of the functional version that they had uh, for Tetris at the time. And it was 1985. Mikhail Gorbachev, or no, in 1985, Gorbachev would come into power as the new general secretary of the Communist Party. Within three years of now is when Soviet citizens could have their own commercial ventures and reap potential benefits. Tetris, though, was a year too early. Mm. Alexei would not see any money from Tetris for 13 years. That's bullshit. Yeah. That is some baby bag when bullshit. You, when you hear about the people and the money they're making, too, it is <laughs> it is extra bullshit. Because Alexi is just like a hardworking motherfucker who makes a good video game. <laughs> a nice game you have there. It's a shame if you didn't make any money off of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you got to keep everything secret. Dude, and they did for a while. But at this point, they said, we don't know how to fucking market this. Give it out. So they just start, everyone, feel free to give it to your friends. Just give it out, give it out. And it quickly just spreads like a virus and just takes yep. over everywhere with computers in Russia. Uh, it was hard not to find it if you like were anywhere around computers. They took the mixtape approach. When the yep. new artist is like, just flood the market with my mixtape. Have you heard my mixtape? And then just give it to friends and friends. And then it builds popularity. And then soon everybody's just talking about this weird tennis game. Tennis or nobody game. liked my Primal Screaming album that I <laughs> sent out. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was good. Okay, well. It was experimental. Yeah. They don't get it. <laughs> You're just screaming. <laughs> my primary influences are Yoko Ono, Yoko Ono, and <laughs> Yoko Ono. <laughs> I just saw that video of her on Reddit not too long ago with uh, John Chuck Lennon Berry and Chuck Berry, where she starts screaming. And Chuck and Berry's cut, like, the fuck? And they cut her mic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny. Oh. Yeah, embarrassing stuff. Yeah, that was, it made me laugh. It's making me laugh I, now just thinking about it. It's not embarrassing <laughs> if she's not embarrassed. It's more or less just cringy. Oh, it's embarrassing for John Lennon. Oh, I don't, I don't know if he and cared. It was aggravating to Chuck Berry. <laughs> Ch Chuck Berry's reaction is so it's funny. like, the too. fuck? <laughs> he, he's just like this. He goes super wide-eyed. Yeah. <laughs> so one of these copies wound up in the hands of Vladimir Pokilko. Pokilko. I will get most pronunciations right. I'm glad you're reading these and not me. They also have like 12 names. Have you ever read a Dostoevsky novel? Uh, They've got like nicknames... I watch a lot of UFC, and I can't pronounce a single one of those fighters' names. And they are really good at fighting. I hear the names a lot. They fight a lot. I should know, but I don't. Yeah. I switched over from Norse mythology pronunciation to Russian pronunciation for this week. <laughs> uh, after God of War Ragnarok, it was, mm. there was a lot of uh, soft J's, but now it is a lot of vodka. <laughs> Which is okay. But Vladimir was a clinical psychology researcher and uh, an acquaintance of Pajitnov. He immediately saw the game's potential for emotional dynamics. He saw this as a new avenue for researching the human brain. This was a game that you didn't need a explanations for. You could give it to somebody and just there's only a couple buttons and people were able to pick it up very quick. And that made it um, very uh, the plasticity that anyone could pick it up and play it. And you could study how they interacted with it. Anyone's mom can learn to play it. It's one of those games where you don't even have to really think. You just do. Yeah. We we came home last night and I'm like, Carly, I want to watch you play Tetris. And she did not want to. Plus, we were drunk. I'm like, I, please. And she's like, fine. And she was frustrated at first. And then she got a line. She's like, all right, I get it. It's fun. She was like frustrated to admit. She's like, yeah, I get it. I get it. And once it gets its claws into you, uh, there's issues, but uh, Vladimir 
He made copies, sent it to other researchers, and after realizing that every staff member of his was addicted, he waited until everyone left the office, went around, grabbed all the copies, and threw them away. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) This is ruining our company. (laughs) But uh, it immediately came back, of course. But yes, over the next couple of years, he used it to psychologically test patients. And they're still having to figure out what they're going to do with this Tetris game. It's out there. People are loving it. Uh, Victor Bergebrin? That I, one's that one I've not nailed. That me. one sounds let tough. Look, let me look at it. He sent a copy. Victor, Victor, uh, we'll call there him we Victor. Go. Yeah. Uh, he sent a copy to Budapest, Hungary, and naturally the game takes over there as well. And student programmers over there made their own version for their Apple II and Commodore sixty four computers because they wanted to work on whatever they have best. And it's simple enough game to where you can reverse engineer it, mm-hmm. and it's kind of a good practice. And a side note, Hungary was one of the earliest bloc nations to start merging Western and Eastern ideologies, including Erno Rubik, who created the Rubik's Cube in 1980 and took the world by storm. That was oh, out of Hungary. that Rubik's Cube. Yeah, people were just like snorting that shit on the streets, just loving it. I cannot imagine. I think one time I got a Rubik's Cube for Christmas and I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> But so, I loved this as a kid. Yeah. You I, also probably played stick and hoop. <laughs> we have we have Game Boy. Yeah, I don't want a cube. My, yeah. my only cube is a GameCube. I almost got into doing like quick solving of Rubik's Cubes because you can there's like a method to it. Better than the stacking cups people. Oh, that's way better than that, yeah. It's more yeah. impressive to do a Rubik's Cube. I've never seen anyone stack cups and be like, holy shit. It's mostly like, that's pretty good. Uh, I can spin a beer, a pint glass in my hand when I pour a beer at work, and I think that's cooler than stacking cups. What do you mean spin a beer? Like I put it on the little sprayer thing, yeah, and then when I lift it up, I give it a nice little 180, yeah. but my it's like my hand doesn't even move because it's all in the fingers. Hey, and listen. then all of a sudden, the glass is right side up, and the little bit of water that sits at the bottom of the glass flies right out. So it's like, And you catch it in your mouth? Yep, and then I spit it at a customer. <laughs> they call it the splash zone. Yeah. <laughs> they, call me, they call me Shamwoo behind, <laughs> Sham, behind the bar. Shamwoo. That, there, that there's blackfish. Yeah. Uh, we're going to meet a new character for our story named Robert Stein. And to give context of what he might look like, he's being played by Toby Jones in the the, the movie. I don't know who Toby Jones is. Toby Jones. He was one of the Nazi scientists in Captain America. He's a little the littler guy. Oh, oh my god, uh, him! Truman. He played Truman Capote in something. Yeah, he plays uh, Ernst um, Zola, Arnim Zola. Yep. He's okay. the fucking computer thing, and yeah. uh, and uh, Winter Soldier. Yep. He was born in Hungary in 1934. He was a refugee of post-World War II era, arrived in the UK in 1956, and struggling in a new country. He tried many endeavors, including selling Pong machines. Uh, He was a computer salesman. And then he realized selling software software would make him a lot more money. It always does. And so he was hired by Commodore to find software for the Commodore 64. So he would go out, find this stuff. He would buy the rights and then license it out. That's where he gets his money. He finds good things for cheap and then sells it for more. That's all his job was. So he headed to his home country of Hungary because he had a unique uh, spot there. They just started opening up their products to get out of the Iron Curtain. And he figured that would be a... Those people don't know what their their stuff's worth. I'll go fucking get it for cheap and then sell it for more. Stein saw Tetris being played there and said, wait a fucking second. This is good. (laughs) He was excited. Problem is though he wanted so he wants to get the rights to Tetris. It's I mean people see it and from a mo- like a money standpoint. Almost everyone gets it. Like it's so simple and everyone gets it. You don't need to have translation. Manu- you don't even need a manual. Yeah, no manual, no, no tutorial. translation, and it also has this unique thing. Being from Russia, this would be the first cultural export out of the country um, since the Iron Curtain's been raised in a long time. First thing that's gotten out. So people are seeing dollar signs when they, the people that see what it's worth. Hmm. But the problem is, how do you contact anyone in the fucking USSR? So 
he Duh, said, the telephone or carrier pigeon. You just got to be sketchy. Where do you go? Where do you go to the yellow? Like the yellow book? You probably use the red book to get into the. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, you just act solid, Brad. <laughs> got him. <laughs> act super sketchy. Wait for the KGB to come snatch you up, and then you'd be like, "Before, well, hold on, hold on." Take me to your leader. I got this fucking tennis. Tetris listen, game. Listen, listen. You must, you must see what I have here. <laughs> it's just blocks. It's I, just the full. It's just blocks. I give you a bottle of vodka, please. You bribe the I KGB. Bet that, I bet that worked. And what? Riding ri- the KGB with vodka. This is good vodka. You like? Yes, you are fine. Go. Americans <laughs> are stupid. <laughs> I can't wait for our Russian listeners to tell us we have bad Russian accents. <laughs> Please. I would love to yeah. hear that. None of my, the, none so of my we can keep good. doing it. Gov. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm from New York. Uh, you can S- tell. Stein was able to get uh, the telex information for Victor. And this message was passed to Alexi. They're still not letting anyone above them in the academy know that they have this product that is taking over, you know, Russia and getting out. And receiving a telex and giving it to Alexi is one thing, which that's sketchy enough to not, like, go through a chain of command. But Alexi had already kind of moved on. And he was surprised to see a message in English inquiring about a licensing deal. But he was interested. So he had to... Find, find someone to translate for him to English, which means he had to fill out forms because mm. you can't just go, hey, can you translate something? You have to fucking paperwork. And he... Wait, so he didn't... He had to get somebody to translate the message that was in English. He couldn't even read it. And then, well, his response, too, had to be translated before he could send it back. That's, and then he had to fill out paperwork in order to send a message. That's scary though, because you don't know what the message reads then, and you just have to trust that this, like, it's okay. This message would become very uh, important in many legal proceedings. So the wording that Alexi was thinking that he had said was, yes, we are interested in the deal, as we want to know more, we would like to talk about it, He was trying to cautiously and optimistically say, yes, we'd like to know more. We're interested in the deal. Robert Stein received this and he says, fucking got it. Got a verbal agreement. I have the rights. This is what Stein said. He was probably a little full of shit, though, too. He probably just wanted to start printing stuff and making money. And he thought, I'll worry about it later. Maybe he did. This is a lot of conjecture as to far as to who agreed to what. But Alexi says... He didn't think that he was agreeing to anything, and Robert Stein claims that he it was a verbal agreement. This is going to be a big deal. <laughs> um, so Stein took this as approval, and he's like, I, I'm the licensor now. And his target was Robert Maxwell. Robert Maxwell, think uh, Rupert Murdoch, international media mogul, multimillionaire. He was born Jan Ludwig Hock in Czechoslovakia, When Hungary annexed this area, he saw the clouds of WW2 forming and left for France. He joined the British Army when Germany took France and changed his name to Ian Robert Maxwell. He fought through the invasion of Normandy. No shit. Became a captain. Still not as cool as that guy who charged with a claymore. I'm going to look that up. He well, this with, he's still cool despite not having a claymore. Yeah, well, at this, mean, a for this thing, really helps. No, at, at, at this point, he's cool. He will not be cool later. Yes. You'll be surprised. I don't think I'd be surprised. I don't like any businessman. <laughs> no, no, there, there's a twist at the end of the story. It's like, wait a second, what the fuck? But he later found out almost every one of his relations died in Auschwitz. He, Ugh, after, I, after, yeah. I can't even fucking imagine. Like, all of his family. It's, it's like, like, okay, now I'm the last. And so he became a book publisher uh Pergamon was the name. And after making connections with various foreigners, he would acquire publication rights and resell them at a profit. These people aren't creators. They are someone that finds something that people don't know the value for and they resell their profiteers. He was a politician. No surprise. (laughs) He bought newspapers and publishing companies, including the Daily Mirror, the New York Daily News, and the publisher Macmillan. He founded a video game company in 1982 with Jim McEnockany. McEnockany. And uh, Jim was a former British Royal Navy officer, and Jim was obsessed with making accurate flight simulator games. So Robert Stein is going to go to Robert Maxwell 
to their video game company as a potential buyer because he knows Maxwell's got the fucking money. Mm. Makes sense. Their company is Mirrorsoft, and Robert Stein walks in with Tetris. Jim, who only wants to make flight simulator games, sees it, and he's like, this is some stupid stuff. I don't like this. It is boring looking. And Stein's like, just, just trust me here. This is good. And so Jim asked the American arm of the company, Spectrum Holobyte is their name. Uh, he asked Phil Adam and Gilman Louie from Spectrum Holobyte to take a look, and they're like, yeah, this is this is something. Yeah, you got a banger right here, bro. We just got to put a dope-ass soundtrack in here, and you're good to go. And that's, someone said that about my mixtape. <laughs> if your screaming mixtape just had, like, some Russian folk music behind it, it might have worked. I, I mean, it had some tube and throat singing in there. Oh, yeah. I need to hear this mixtape. <clears throat> is that like... You ever... I can do it. What's tube and throat singing? Tubin. Tubin. Is that where you like cycle air and then you never stop screaming? No, it's a. Uh, it's. Hold on. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, that's how you do it, man. That, that's, <laughs> like, that's a banger. It's like Mongolian or something. Yeah, uh, it's Tubin. Yeah, it's. That's Mongolia. insane. That noise just came out of Dylan. I saw him do it. it. Sounds like a didgeridoo to me a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I used it. More like a Dillany Doo. A Dillany Doo. Dillany Doo. <laughs> that would be the name of your first album, Sounds of the Dillany Doo. <laughs> I Dillany did it. <laughs> That's that, nice. that'd, be the, that'd be the first review. <laughs> he Dillany did it. <laughs> and someone would say, Dillany, don't miss out on this one. I was like, it's all right, just that's spinning enough. papers flying towards the screen with the headlines. <laughs> it's just me going, Wee. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> it's easy to do. You can learn how to do it pretty quick. But uh, Phil and Gilman for Spectrum Holobyte, they're like, this would be the first product in North America from the USSR. This is a big deal. And they agreed to the deal. If Jim agrees, like, all right, Stein, we'll take the deal. If Spectrum Holobyte will take the American market and then we'll take the British market. That way, Jim's like, we'll split up the risk. So one of them takes this risk and we'll take this risk. And meanwhile, Miyamoto's sitting on a, at a desk somewhere, like in a war room, and he's just like, "Yes, I will bide my time." Miyamoto around this time was retrofitting arcade machines in America to create Donkey Kong because Eric Kawa, who we'll meet later, uh, found uh, Miyamoto. Miyamoto school. Um, controversial opinion, right? Eh. Pretty controversial. Kind of scary looking sometimes. He's gotten scary as he got older. When he came out with the Master Sword, I was like, is he going to stab someone? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You never know. But uh, yeah, so Phil and Gilman, they realized since this is like USSR stuff, they're like, we got to play up the Russian aspect. So when you said throw a soundtrack on that, there wasn't a soundtrack yet. So they were the ones who said, put some Russian music in there. Some Russian folk music, yeah. So that wasn't Alexei's idea, but the fact that... Uh, Kora Baniki, which we'll talk a little bit later, which is the name of the song. They're the ones who um, got that in there. So it's 1986 at this time. Uh, Reagan is president. Gorbachev, uh, and he spoke on television with each other's citizens. They're really starting to like kind of get open. And direct commercial air flights resumed for the first time since 1978. And uh, essentially, you don't want to offend Russia because things are getting good. Mm -hmm. The deal is made. Jim offered 3,000 pounds up front, and once money was returned, a fluctuating royalty rate would happen. Phil Adam cut a uh, check for $11,000 for the American market. Must be nice. And Stein doesn't have the fucking deal yet. He, he doesn't have a contract. He is selling rights to things he doesn't have. And so Stein's like, I'm retaining arcade rights. He doesn't have them, but he sold uh, PC rights to these people. It gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> um, yeah, he still didn't have anything on paper. Stein just figures, you know, if Russia didn't respond or didn't go the way he wanted, he would license the Hungarian version he played first and just claim that was the one that he licensed, although that was just a ripoff of the original one. He thought, fuck it. He essentially did the Bill O'Reilly, like, fuck it, we'll do it live. We'll make it up. <laughs> it really I makes me wonder why this didn't happen more with, like, Flash games from the early 2000s. Because those are all homebrew kind of situations. I'm surprised none of those got like straight up stolen because I remember there were a few like legit ones. Now that I think about it, Alien Hominid actually did come out on GameCube. Maybe they did. Like maybe uh, a lot of those Flash games did get stolen. Yeah, I, Zombie I, I, Horde came out 
at one point on the 360 with PlayStation 4 or something like that. And that was one of those early games that I played on, like Crazy Monkey Games or Mini Clip or something. Interesting. So, Stein intended to offer Russia 75% of royalty on sales after everybody else had already gotten paid. So they would essentially get fucked. But it sounds good if you're not paying attention to the deal. As well as $10,000 straight up. And foreign currency on the table in Russia, very good. Mm-hmm. Only 10000 well, That's they, worth a lot. They have no idea what the value is. And that I mean, just does do. not... I mean, that doesn't seem like a lot of money for... I mean, even back then. So, but, like, you... Like, it's a billion dollar industry now a lot of this was not like unless you yeah. were in an arcade you weren't making hand that's over true fist. especially home market type stuff and computer market type stuff yeah just didn't exist so stein still has never gone to russia he sends another telex offering this deal and pagetnov responded much quicker this time it only took 10 days to go through all the paperwork and get the response out and the letter was co-signed by pagetnov and yuri g of tushenko who was the director of the computer center. And essentially they just said the same thing. Like we want to make a deal. They thought they were just still like, we're interested, but Stein's like fucking got them. They, they totally, (laughs) we got it. And Pachinov didn't know that Stein was off doing this. They have no fucking clue. Uh, This is around the time when the Soviets became aware of the deal. And they, they're like this, this doesn't seem uh, copacetic. This isn't legit. This is uh, not a good time. Go get my fucking translator. <laughs> Something's wrong. So the in-house publishing group Academy Soft did the negotiating now. The high ups in the USSR still don't know what's happening. But this is like another company just slightly above them. It's like, all right, we're negotiating now. And this wouldn't be the last shifting of control. Alexei, at every step of the way, would lose more and more control. They kept him around, though, because he's the guy. It looks good for negotiations. It's spring of 1987. No deal has been made, and Stein felt he needed Russia to agree and offered them more money in deals for more computers out of um, just IBM, something else, uh, which he'd already agreed to go with Mirosoft and Spectrum Holobyte. He's, he's already made deals. He's just trying to get some fucking paperwork. In June 1987, Stein signed a deal with other game companies despite no authorization from the USSR. He's signing away more rights. I did want to mention uh, that Spectrum Holobyte, they wanted to play up the Russian aspects of the game like we mentioned. This is the Russian folk music. You might know it. Ding, do, do, ding, do, do, do. Everyone knows that song. Yeah. It's a Russian folk song. It's uh, 19th century, and it tells a story of a meeting between a peddler and a girl. Uh, describes their haggling over goods and a metaphor for courtship. He offers goods for sexy time. So that is the, the Tetris song. The Tetris song. song is a man propositioning a woman for sex. Well, yep, by like, check out my check out my rap album I got. Yeah. Do you see all my goats? This is Dylan's... You lay with This me. is Dylan do. <laughs> you would like this. Would you like to kiss me? <laughs> <laughs> What's he bore at now? <laughs> We're doing our best here with our... <laughs> <laughs> it's the best we got. <laughs> that's all we got. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's Korobaniki. And also this version, um, the the one from Spectrum Holobyte, Red Box. It's got Moscow St. Basil's Cathedral on the cover. And they added a background of the game of Russian life, just like, I don't know, people standing in bread lines. But not. It was like... They played up how nice Russia looked, and they wanted to make it look classy. Didn't want to offend anybody. Ah, concrete and snow. Picturesque. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Here is people drinking. <laughs> but they are not sad drinking. They are happy drinking. Drink happy for the picture. We send it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They're just kind of like wry smiles. Like, mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they did add specific colors for game blocks here. So it wasn't just random colors for the different block shapes. This was if you got the the L that with like the left hinky, then you knew it was like going to be this color. It helped you visually like understand what the block was on another level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was a cool intro, uh, addition as well. It's January 1988. Stein still doesn't have the fucking rights. Uh, Spectrum Holobyte throws a huge release for the game. This is like the first official release. And... It was at the Herbst Theater, part of San Francisco's War Memorial and Performing Arts Center. 
and they invited the Russian ambassador. And he was quite upset with the imagery of the game. He thought it was insulting. There was one part that was uh, he found very offensive. Uh, around this time, there was a, a pilot who flew a plane into like the center of Moscow and landed from another country. And he got arrested, of course, for mm-hmm. hooliganism, which is my favorite thing to get arrested for. Yeah, that's, <laughs> oh man, if only. What are you in for? Hooliganism. <laughs> We're going to run your back track, uh, background check. We'd love to hire you. Is there just anything we might find on there? It was a bit of a hooligan. I got a little drunk and flew a plane. <laughs> but it's the kind of hooligan that you can get behind. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but he wouldn't have a Russian accent. Uh, he was from outside the USSR. I think he was either German, but it'd be a different accent than Russian. Not even going to try that one. Yeah, but there was a plane in one of the images, and they're like, you're you're making fun of Russia for having like not having controlled airspace, and they found it a little offensive. Yo, homie, you know planes exist, right? Like People but, are very <laughs> like... A single plane, though, was going into Moscow. It was a very hot topic at the time. Like, it, I think it was definitely referencing that. So they were wearing Nightmare Before Christmas uh, bracelets. Oh, it was hot. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are I loved Invader Zim socks. <laughs> yeah. They have a My Chemical Romance shirt. Uh, and there is the first time Tyler referenced My Chemical Romance this episode, everybody. It's hey, you knew it was coming. I, yeah. I was thinking about a graph. Uh, amount of times MCR gets mentioned before Tyler joins, and it'd be at zero. <laughs> and once Tyler for the podcast, there'd just be a, st- a line straight up. <laughs> <laughs> I have no shame. No, and you shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, but yes, they were wearing Twilight shirts, and they were... Uh, getting scrunchies of Beetlejuice. All those stupid bracelets that girls used to wear in high school, where they would go all the way yeah. up their arm like a gauntlet. Oh, They'd yeah. they wear like 87 of them. I had one of them, and I later felt embarrassed to have it. I had the I Heart Boobies bracelet that I didn't take off for like a year. Jesus and I was like, Christ. I am embarrassed about and that. And during that time, you got a lot of action? No. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, no, but I switched it. I switched it to a My Chemical Romance bracelet that said, I don't support anything. And I thought that was ironic and funny. Everything I did for about 10 years was really cringeworthy. Yeah. And now it's only. Ha- <laughs> and now, now it's, only- it's almost over. And now it's only half of them. <laughs> uh, the ambassador, however, <laughs> relented and realized this game is good and it's mostly positive. He doesn't m- mention anything back to the rest of the USSR, but he's aware of it. Stein, though, is realizing he's getting way more fucked because there's a commercial release out there. And he doesn't have a contract. He has nothing other than like a verbal agreement. And he's just wheeling and dealing out there. And uh, yeah, so it was January 1988. The Apple II version came out at $35.95. Uh, New York Times called it simple and addictive. Chicago Tribune said... Glassnost reaches computer games, a game so good, you won't be able to say yet to it. Oh, my God. That's that pretty good, though. And the guy, the guy wrote that down, and he's like, fuck, I got it. Dude, I'm so good. <laughs> it's just sweating as he's typing out <laughs> yet. <laughs> uh, he can't wait. Chris, he's so happy. Chris, his hands are shaking. <laughs> uh, Stein, at this point, was informed he would now be negotiating with Elorg from now on. Alorg, E-L-O-R-G. We'll mention them after a quick break to hear from another amazing show from the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Alex, hi, I'm Ray. How would you explain our show, No More Walkers? Are you a nerd having trouble transitioning from your 20s to 30s to 40s and beyond? Age with us, not at us. I'm already gray. Are you tired of the man keeping you down? If you see something, say something. Do you enjoy the family computer? Capsule computing. We got them all. No More Whoppers. We outlived the queen. She said it couldn't be done. No, I'm fading. <laughs> Come back. I can't do this alone. Do you enjoy number munchers? And is numbers what you call p- Then listen to No More Whoppers. Only on the Tokyo Beat Network. after a while that sounds painful the whole time (laughs) all you do have to do is growl and then do a low tone that matches the growl i'm sure that some of mcr songs have that no then i guess you wouldn't know it not a one e-l-o-r-g 
the Electro Norg Technica became aware of Tetris when their employee, Alexander Alexinko, discussed um, how they would be working together. So Alorg kind of came over and took over Academy Soft. It was a new thing, a new like partner, or a new work uh, relationship. Mm. Alexander Alexinko, he was talking with Pagetnov, and Pagetnov doesn't know what he's up. Like, he probably sh- should have done things a little differently. But he mentioned that they were having trouble talking with an Englishman named Stein about licensing a video game. Who was not actually an Englishman. And Alexinko, <laughs> Alexinko is like, stop. You're not qualified to talk about this. I'm not legally allowed to talk with you about this. Everything you're doing is really dangerous. Alexander's essentially like, He's like, we got to fucking not say another word until we get people involved because he knew, like, if the wrong people found out, everyone would be in a lot of shit. He yeah. Was, yeah. He was you, the first one not drinking vodka for a while, and he sobered up. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are we doing? <laughs> this is a problem not even Kettle One can fix. Get, get off the table quick. <laughs> yeah. We have to talk. So, yeah, he stopped them. And, yeah, so that, that's when Alorg uh, took over. Alexinko looked at the documents that they had, the the telexes from Stein, and deduced that they seemed to be having parallel, separate conversations. They were like, Stein thought one thing was happening, and Pagetnov thought the other thing was happening. But they were talking back and forth, but separate conversations. And probably made worse due to the fact that everything had to be translated. Yep, subtleties. they, They were, he's like, this looks bad, but he thought no money has transferred between anyone yet i think there's still negotiations to be had here so alexinko contacted robert stein and said we will sell the game directly uh, ourselves and whatever deal you think we had was we're done we're not dealing with you robert stein and stein <laughs> pretty good negotiator here he says wow the ussr would look very weak if you did this now after you have a hot selling game and you're mm-hmm. trying to pull it off the shelves it would look really bad for you guys trying to open up your country and snapping something back real quick that dude carries his balls around in a wheelbarrow also this was not in person thankfully otherwise yeah. he, <laughs> also, if he was in Ru- moscow he would not be he would have been like are you also mean? that pandora box pandora's box is already open like there's no there's no going back yeah there's been a release for the game now <clears throat> yeah people have it and they can recreate it if they want there will be other games that Tetris versions released that will get snapped mm-hmm. back, though. Uh, but Alex Sinko, um, Stein actually does at this point uh, travel to Moscow. And after long talks, they had a contract written in February 1988. Um, neither were quite ready to sign, but they did in May. And it was signed strictly for computer games. This is also important uh, wording, computer games. So no deal yet for arcades or TV consoles, home console games. Entertainment systems, as they called them. Stein, though, he's like, hmm, that's a computer. It's all computers. So he's like, I have all the rights. Stein immediately (laughs) oversteps himself again. (laughs) So Mirrorsoft gets what they think is the rights to everything. Uh, Mirrorsoft ran by Robert Maxwell and Jim McNockany. Mm -hmm. And... So they sublicense the rights to make arcade cabinets to Atari. So now Atari believes they have the rights for arcade cabinets, who then sublicense them to Sega because they sold them out to Sega. So Sega thinks that they have the rights um, to make arcade cabinets. Uh, Stein realized, like, I probably need to get another contract. We'll worry about it later. But the deal uh, did happen in Paris with Stein and Alexinko, where they met to discuss arcade rights after he already sold the rights. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's really funny. This to me. just reminds me of like the Anchorman scene after the fight where Will Ferrell's like, yeah, it escalated very quickly. <laughs> yeah, that got out of hand fast. <clears throat> like, just Turns out in. you should consult a lawyer before doing anything. Yeah, not if you're, you not pissed off all the USSR, dude. You should lay low for a while. Yeah, like they could they could come snatch you up in the middle of the night. Yeah, well, Stein, though, was lucky to be dealing with Alex Cinco because Alex Cinco was a, a younger, more open-minded person who would travel to Paris and would have talks. Stein offered $30,000 advance plus a royalty rate. Alex Cinco was upset that they hadn't received any money for anything that's already been sold for the arcade cabinets. He's like, you're fucking us over every step of the way. But he demanded new de- the New Deal had penalties for late payments and interest. Arcade rights officially now do belong to Stein and Mirosoft. 
the Ministry of Trade, Russia's ministry did get a hold of some of the advertisements for the game around this time, and they uh, felt insulted and damaged. So at this point, we're going to do a major rewind while I introduce us to our next hero in, in the story here, played by Taron Egerton in the film. He's the main character of the Tetris film. Wait, who's, t- who's Taron Egerton? I know that name. He was, a, he was the guy in The Kingsman. Oh, he played Elton John, didn't he? Yep. Yep. He will be playing Hank Rogers. Hank Rogers. Uh, when um, does this movie come out? In like two weeks. Fuck yeah, dude. Dude, yeah. Hank Rogers. Imagine uh, Freddie Mercury's mustache. Yes. That's him. Fuck yeah. He's just a big mustache motherfucker. And his family was in the gemstone business. We're going to learn a lot about Hank here because it's important. Uh, at 11 years old, he left Amsterdam for New York. He learned how to speak English from watching American language uh, oh, television. Speed Racer, Gigantor, Looney Tunes, Rocky and Bullwinkle. Um, you know, you learn the important stuff about the Russians and Rocky and Bullwinkle, I'm sure. That's how it probably influenced some of his dealings. <laughs> Natasha and Boris, yeah. <laughs> Did Danny DeVito play Boris? Is that him? Yeah. The picture you put in the yep. Discord? So that's that's Hank, and that, then... And that's Alexi on the right. With a copy of Tetris. And An important awesome. copy of Tetris, we'll find out. So uh, Hank here is now in America, and he's learning to speak English, drawn to computers very quickly. Uh, Access to the single computer at his Catholic school, though, was, however, not easy. You would have to fill out a punch card, and you'd have to leave it, and then somebody else would go through the punch cards and punch them in when you're not there, and you would come back and see what the punch card did with the computer. Mm. Different times. Tom would know about this. He was there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, Tom has a whole room full of punch cards <laughs> This is my very first punch card And this is my 10,000th And they're just framed <laughs> on his wall <clears throat> But So what Hank would do would He'd sneak in and put his punch card At the front of all of the boxes Like when he was, he'd sneak in and like move them around And he'd also put So if you were trying to write a program Or do anything You'd have a punch card, see the results, have to change it. So if he wanted to make any changes, he'd have to wait like a full week or whatever to make any changes. That's for the birds. So he'd get the results from one where they sneak forward. He put it in another class's box and he'd get that. So he's able to kind of speed line Mm. the process quite a bit. Very cool. I like that move. But uh, after high school, his family moved to Japan for the gemstone business. And he didn't want to go learn another new culture at the age of 19. So he moved to Hawaii. And in order to stay close to computers, he went to night school. He was told, though, he would need to be a full-time student for more access. He said, I don't want a fucking diploma at all. I'm not going to take any generals. I'm only taking classes involved with computers. So he knew straight up he would never get a diploma with the way he was going to college. And he didn't care. He was there strictly for computers. Well, Plus, if your family's in the gemstone business, you also, probably don't have to worry. Too but much. also, it wasn't expensive back then. <laughs> Remember, God damn, you're right. Yeah, you're it's, you're thinking in today times. Literally, you could have a part time job for a thousand for a, years because he took two classes in college. You could have a part time job in the summer and then pay for college. So yeah, it's also you buy a house and pay for seven kids. Yeah, and some people did. They all turned out great. And then they changed the laws to make it tough for us. Yeah, but look at us now. We have a podcast. Take I that. Have ch- I have a child yeah. out there somewhere. Do you? Yeah, I was a sperm donor. Oh, yeah, we talked about this. That's right. Wow. I'm going to see some kid that looks like you in the future. Uh, I, I feel bad for whatever lesbian couple got me. Hmm. If it was a lesbian couple. <laughs> I'm hoping. Yeah. Actually, it's true. It, it was. They. I was contacted. Oh, my God. Wow. I don't know if I was, if I knew that. Because we I, talked about this on the podcast. I've got a before. son out there somewhere. What's their name? I don't know. Okay. That was not disclosed. And I wouldn't disclose that on a podcast if I did. So he only signed up for classes to go to com- get access to computers. At this time, Dungeons and Dragons was sweeping the country. This was 1974. You mean Ra- Satanist propaganda? Uh, yeah, the devil was sweeping the country is how I would phrase it. Perfect. What a time to be alive. Right in the middle of Satanic Panic and Judas Priest. Yeah, the weed sucked, though. Yeah, that was, it was all ditch weed. Yeah. Still, ditch weed's better than no weed. That is true. Hey, oh, my man. Pick those seeds out like a man. Even Bad Vodka is 
good vodka. <laughs> <laughs> Even bad vodka is good vodka. <laughs> That's a fucking quote right there. <laughs> but Rogers and his friends were obsessed with Dungeons and Dragons. In 1976, Rogers was forced to leave school. They said, if you don't take any requirements after three years, you have to leave. And he said, okay. See ya. Bye. This man is already quickly becoming my hero. <laughs> He's amazing. This guy's amazing. But uh, so he moves to Japan. Uh, he also had a sweetheart from Hawaii that came with him there. She was from Japan. So he had like one Perfect. in outside of his family. So it wasn't That's literally just... the only way to get, nat- to get into that society at that point. His family, though, did have a lot of money in Japan. So he, they had a bit of an in. So it wasn't but just they, on a whim. Uh, you didn't yeah. see a lot of white people in Japan around that time. And breaking into that business was tough, too, yeah. into that scene because, yeah, yeah uh, foreigners had it much more difficult. Yeah. But he married his Japanese sweetheart, Akemi, in 1977. And with no college degree and no grasp of Japanese, he moved into the family gem business. Six years pass. They have a bunch of kids. And he wound up having to do a lot of traveling for the business. In 1982, he was, I forget, he was in another country and he missed the birth of his third child. And he said, I'm done with the gems business. I don't want to do this anymore. I like computers. I'm going to get back into computers. So at 29 years old, he got a small gig at Hitachi. When asked to break into one of their own discs and copy it, he refused. He said, "What? this is a sketchy thing. Because, you know, but that's like their test. But when no when one company is spread out oh. amongst multiple things, some guy was trying to get access to a program that oh. they probably would have need to pay for. I don't know. He realized the, the illegality, the deal looks sketchy, like the, the right. job. So he he didn't want to do that. He was offered a programming job and to create an accounting program for their version of basic. It went so well that he was invited to the headquarters, a fancy place like a real headquarters, big doors. Big, big, big doors. The receptionist, they, everything. Did they have the spinny door, though, the revolving door? Uh, probably. Because that's how you know your HQ is made. <laughs> in Russia, you actually take the tape off of the, the cardboard and push it open. <laughs> but in Japan, they might have had the rotating doors there. Well, first you have to remove the nails. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pull those two by fours off the windows, <laughs> reach in and pull the latch. I think Russia's fair game now. We can just make fun of Russia totally. And it's, right? it's one of those things. I don't hate all of the Russian people because a lot of them, it's not their war, but they're being forced into it. A lot of them are probably just normal people, but yes, fuck everything that's happening in Ukraine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it's hard to like, there's yeah, probably some, didn't know th- we support Ukraine. There, there might be like some good little kid out there making the new Tetris on a computer right now. And he might the not new have new Tetris. It's just called new Tetris and it's just <laughs> Tetris. <laughs> We're not going to talk about all the iterations of Tetris. I know, I know. But there are some weird there, ones. Yeah. Hattress, Faces, Tris 3. I think I've played a little bit of Hattress. It's actually not bad. Hattress is one of the better ones. Yeah. But so he's invited to the headquarters. He has the master copy on a floppy disk in his pocket. because, And he knew something sketchy was going on. So he had magnets specifically placed in his pocket to where if the deal, like whatever the negotiations were weird, he was going to just run a magnet across and just like wipe it. Wipe it. That's baller. Dude, he's just in his pocket. And he's like, got a trump card right there. And... No deal. <laughs> yeah, they, they wanted him to just hand it over uh, without, like, making a, a deal for, like, this program he helped make. I don't know the the full why he was so worried about it, but he refused. He was rightfully worried. He refused to give give them the, the disc, and he left Hitachi. Yeah. With his balls in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> Big mustache energy. Yeah. At this point, uh, Rogers realized uh, video games, role-playing games, were not anywhere in Japan. That's not a part of that culture yet. And he had never programmed a video game, but the time was now, so he bought the equivalent of a $10,000 computer. He exchanged half of the Proto Company for $50,000. And um, he started making a game that would become, if not the first, it's one of the first, but the first important turn-based Japanese RPG in history. It's not East, is it? Black Onyx. Okay. So this came out before East, before Dragon Quest, before Final Fantasy. Okay. Black Onyx is the game. Black Onyx. Black Onyx. Uh, to save space, character creation and storage were on a separate magnetic cassette mm-hmm. tape. And um, 
He called it Black Onyx, possibly out of hating gems or out of reverence to his family's gemstone business. But he did name it after a gem. But this was his video game. Yeah, mix of both. Mix of both. Have you ever played this? No, but I did look at some of the, the images and it's actually, it looks solid. Yeah. yeah, that looked much... That, I mean, I'm just looking at images on Google, but it looks way more impressive than I thought it was going to... When I was reading this, I'm like, this dude created like the first turn-based Japanese RPG. <laughs> I love that. It also looks like a dungeon crawler with uh, Vexel um, lines. Selling the game, though, is going to be tough for him. He is a foreigner. He has no experience, like... No, like, check this g other game out I made. Yeah, he doesn't even have a diploma from the college that he was attending. So he was trying to sell it to... Did you know they released Black Onyx on the Game Boy Color? Yeah. Does that mean I can play it on my Switch? It made a few ports. Interesting. Yeah, and there was a sequel as well, but Hank didn't like the sequel as much because his team weren't up to uh, his standards. Hmm. But SoftBank was someone he was trying to sell the game to, and they were legit. They're like, you should become your own publisher. They actually kind of helped him move along without taking advantage of him, which was really cool. Uh, the first mistake he made that was using Western style art of a bare chested man and Japanese people just did not respond to this image as well. Yeah. You can look up the, the you're image. talking about the box art. Imagine Conan the barbarian. Yeah. It's there. Yep. Uh, I only buy covers with buff dudes on it. I thought they got pecs. I, I like my men to look like effeminate boys. Why is he all like big, big muscles? And this is to like, me, Mega Man's not a little boy. He's a Mega Man. <laughs> he's got a laser blast. Have you seen the quads in Castlevania? Yeah. They got the downstairs covered. I'm going to cover the upstairs. <laughs> but this, yeah, sales were shit when it came out. Um, he then brought the game and he's like, this is good. This is a fucking special game and no one gets it. Also explaining like. This is a turn-based RPG. What does it mean? No one's ever played one. No. It's outside of their understanding. It's just some naked dude on a poster, and they're like, oh, cool, man. Good for you. Yeah, what do I do with it? But what do I do with this thing? So Hank was smart. He brought the game to different tech magazines, and he guided them through character creation. Uh, name it after yourself. So there's this little, like, Tyler the Dwarf. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're invested. That's Tyler. You care about Tyler. Yeah. Once you give the character a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a actual design, a little personality. You become attached. You become attached. A My Chemical Romance tattoo. I got, yeah. Yep. But, except Tyler the Dwarf would have it on his can face because he's a... But can I put a Black Parade tattoo on there? Yeah. And Tyler's like, yeah, we'll take it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Get a little skelly Only tattoo. if you connect through Ubisoft Connect. Yeah. We need your email. And you have to agree to a few things. Whoa, yeah. I don't know about that. If there was a DLC for My Chemical Romance tattoos in a game for $1.99, would you pay it? It depends on the game. Like, How about um, Red Dead Redemption 3? <laughs> no, if I was playing Cyberpunk, 20, oh. yeah, if I was playing Cyberpunk and they were like, you give us $2 and you can put the Black Parade tattoo on your character. But there's like Rock Band MCR. I would think about it. Uh, they have some there is some songs. Though. Yeah, there is. I bought all of them that were available, and then I got Rocksmith for my actual guitar, and oh, yeah. I bought all of the Mikey McCormick songs. How is on that? There too. I've, no, I've always wondered about that. It Does helped it me immensely learn guitar. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it is uh, the only reason that I can play a handful of songs. I can play "Drops of Jupiter" by Train because that's one. That one's really easy, and "Blitzkrieg Bop." So wait a second. You're saying you know how to play guitar? You can throat sing. I have. I can play. I, also I can play, play the accordion. I can. Well. <laughs> No, you're the throat singer in this band. Well, he could do both. Can you do both at the same time? I can also play a mean tambourine. At the same time? All if we time. put a tambourine on his hip or <laughs> on his foot. You're just like shaking your just, butt back and forth and doing gyrating and throat <laughs> singing. <laughs> <laughs> and we only play one song and it's Drops of Jupiter. So after Rogers, he got these uh, <laughs> magazines to play the, play the game. He like left the copies with them. Uh, articles came out. In magazines then, after, you know, three months, he had almost no sales. Uh, once the article hit the magazines, 10,000 copies were sold immediately. By the end of 1984, the Black Onyx was the best-selling computer game in Japan. Jesus Christ. Dude, did, dude, hit it. Did it have, like, a story that drove through it? Oh, yeah. It was, yeah. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's an RPG. It's, like, a fully realized turn-based RPG. Seen, have you seen the... Uh... 
Let me see. Like you, you had it up on your phone. Like it, it looked fully functional. It had the uh, characters and the the only problem is in the when, left column, and then uh, it was like a dungeon crawler. The only problem is when you pull it up on Google Images without diving into the website. I don't know what which is what are the true. ports or what's the first one. Yeah. So like this picture I'm looking at, that's very rudimentary. Could possibly be that's the, it. Yeah. That's it. I, so. I love the little characters. They at one glance, I know they're holding weapons. It looks like they're giving you the bird. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> I'm oh, you, Tyler. I'm gonna save it. I'll put it in the Discord after the episode. There you go. So at this point, Hank Rogers is a big success, and he says, "All right, I want to meet Hiroshi Yamauchi." He doesn't just go to like one step up. He goes to the fucking top. He says, "I want to meet the president of Nintendo." You don't just get to meet the president of Nintendo. But he knew Yamauchi was a huge fan of the game Go, which is famously the first open world game Yamauchi? ever made. Yamauchi or, Yam- or Yamauchi? 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 Yamauchi, maybe? Yeah. One of those. The Nintendo president. The guy. When oh. you ever see the Nintendo like businessman with like glasses and looks like he's a mean as fuck negotiator. How's it spelled? Y-A-M-A-U-C-H-I. It's Yamauchi. 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 Yeah. But... He knew that this guy liked Go, the first open world game yep. ever made. I love the Go. Thousands of years old. <clears throat> I love Go. My great, 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 great grandfather played it. The first open world game. I remember strolling across the fields of Go. I am from <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> Check out the history of football games. <laughs> Please do. It's a real barn the, burner. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, he wanted to get uh, Yamauchi's attention, so he sent a fax saying he wanted to make Go for the Nintendo, which was no one had ever been able to do before because that game was complicated. And he says, it's not that complicated. To program for the NES. I guess. Uh, whatever. It was it was not done, and it was difficult. Yeah. So he sent a fax saying he wanted to do it. Within 48 hours, he was face-to-face with Yamauchi in his office. Big mustache energy. Big mustache energy, yes. And... He was asked, how much would it take? He's like, 300,000 bucks. About 30 million yen. He kind of just pulled a number. He didn't really know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he's all right, though, because his family has money. So he could theoretically back any costs if he goes over that. So he gets like a a small term loan. At this point, it seems like he's separated from that. At At this point, though, he's working with Nintendo. He was just pumped. But Yamauchi agreed to the deal. So he's working on Go and... We don't need to talk Where's about... Where's the Hanafuda cards? <laughs> yeah, I actually have some. I know. Yeah. But, you ever uh, played Hanafuda? No, I just looked at the pretty pictures of Mario on them. I actually learned how to do it. It's kind of fun. Because cards were illegal for a while, so they made Hanafuda instead of regular playing cards mm-hmm. because of gambling. Yeah, but also, it's, it's, like, it's like solitaire, but not really. It's pretty fucking good. Oh. Uh, from what I understand, Yamauchi didn't even like the version of Go that he made, but it was good enough to where Hank Rogers was now working uh, for Nintendo. He was out there trying to find games to sell. And at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1988 in Las Vegas, Hank Rogers stands in a line. Um, he didn't know what the line was for. It was a long line. It was for Tetris. And the game was mystifying to him. He played it. He's like... It seems fine. Like, I don't get the, the draw. And he sat there and he saw people get back into line multiple times. And he's like, this, okay, wait a second. What's going on here? So he got in line four more times. And he just he kept, didn't get it, though? He didn't get it initially. He knew it was something, but he didn't understand how big of a deal it was the moment until I, he got into line five times. The he, moment I first played Tetris on Game Boy was huge for me. I was like, well, I don't have to do anything else. Well, I guess. No longer, I'm no longer my pay, playing uh, pocket blackjack on my my grandma's little. Uh, L- oh, those old. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot about those. That used to be my favorite. I had my, a my Texas dad, it actually right by his chair. You just diddle around on that, yeah. yeah, dude. The amount of times I played that little blackjack thing, I got good at blackjack. We should go to the casino sometime. No, uh, I mean, I, for blackjack, I I think I could do pretty well. Okay, I'm just picturing. The hangover? Uh, st- yeah, standing over Dylan. I would Dylan spend maybe 50 bucks. Nothing well, above that, algebraic but. equations come on the screen, and Dylan is just counting cards. <laughs> they call me Blackjack. Dylan's like, you dropped 48 toothpicks. It's Rain Man. Oh, okay. 48 toothpicks. Yeah. 48. 48. 48. 48. 48. Um, 
So after seeing this and the success of Black Onyx, he's now in licensing and distribution. He wants some of Tetris. He doesn't know what Tetris is available. He wants some of Tetris. So Now, what version of Tetris was this? This was the one that Spectrum Holobyte released. They okay. had like Apple II versions. They had, I, I forget. There was a lot of PCs. I wonder uh, what they were charging. Tom would have known. He worked on them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. We should give him a call. This actually is when he pro- Tom was probably on these computers. I don't I know. Really, I should really call the home. I think he might be lonely. <laughs> Does he remember <laughs> us? <laughs> no, he's fine. It's bingo night tonight. Oh, yeah. And then tomorrow's karaoke. Yeah. He can I, sing uh, all of his favorite hits from the 20s. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my baby. <laughs> oh, my honey. Can you oh. spare a dime? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but spectrum holobyte owned the japanese rights according to them and according to mirrorsoft so hank invites them to japan which is phil adam and gilman louis a deal was made for floppy disks and living room game consoles in the japanese market Hmm. so uh gilman louis informed mirrorsoft they made a deal like guys we did it we made a great deal and Jim McNockany, who is the English side of Mirrorsoft, he's like, oh, no, we already made a deal with someone for those rights. You guys don't have those rights. No one has the rights. But they thought that they had the rights to sell the Japanese market, and they sold them with Atari, and it was for all rights to home game, ca- game consoles in North America and Japan. So these rights have been sold to two different companies from one company uh, that no one had the rights to. Mm-hmm. That is, I think, by def- definition, and correct me if I'm wrong, a clusterfuck. It is a big mess. <laughs> and meanwhile, uh, in Russia, they're just drunk on vodka. They have no idea anything's going on. <laughs> yeah, that I didn't think about the Iron Curtain kind of working both ways. That's, I mean, yeah, you, you can't. Because they're not extending out. Like They don't want their people to know how good it is in other countries. Yeah. So, I mean, you're hiding what's going on in your own country, but you're also kind of sheltering yourself from they the outside They have as much too. cabbage as they want any time. They can just buy it? That's my Russian. Sorry. And this is the 80s. Like, you heard the Vanilla Ice? He's very hip-hop. They very have three cool. records of his in America. Three of them. <laughs> we have one. If you, would, if you were caught humming Ice Ice Baby. Now let us well, make no, another. The, the wall came down. Never mind. So that's after the fact. <laughs> My joke was going to be... Hasselhoff was there. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. I wish I could have this vanilla rice record, but I simply must create another barrel fire. <laughs> <laughs> Vinyl burns real good. <laughs> it is warm at least. <laughs> I love vanilla ice too. This is very bad. He's, his name is Ice, but his... Voice is so warm. (laughs) (laughs) Just wait till someone smuggled in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. Oh, God. I don't like him anymore. (laughs) Turtles. What is a pizza? (laughs) 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 I am not familiar. (laughs) (laughs) No, it just, it would have taken one Italian guy to show up in the USSR and blow their minds. He's just spinning dough. <laughs> he's, a, he's a witch, obviously. Uh, clearly. He's clearly, clearly a witch. witchcraft. Baba Yaga, maybe. I do not know. <laughs> you killed Vanilla Ice's dog? <laughs> <laughs> That's. Do you know whose dog you killed? <laughs> That's Vanilla Ice's dog. <laughs> Who's Vanilla Ice? Ice Ice Baby? Oh my, my god. god. Oh no. They call him the Baba Yaga. <laughs> Hide Nakajima, oh God, the Atari Games boss, he wanted to use Atari's game making business Tengen for Tetris. Uh, Rogers now had an adversary. Jim had a verbal deal with Nakajima for Tengen to make home console versions of Tetris. These verbal deals are going to get they're just dangerous. But Mirrorsoft would get. PC game rights for Atari's upcoming game, game Blasteroids in exchange for Tetris rights. I play Bast- Blasteroids. It is a very bad deal in hindsight. Yes. Yes. And also, the deal that Phil Adam and Gilman Louie were going to make with Hank Rogers, way more profitable, way better. 
All they got was Blasteroids for exchanging rights to the home console market for Tetris. And um, Phil and Louie said Blasteroids was lame as fuck. It's just a de- uh, derivative of Asteroids. It's it not was. even good. They just added a BL. Yeah. You, just, you can't do that. You blast them. It's going to be great. Mirrorsoft, as it was mostly owned by Robert Maxwell, um, was the... Robert Maxwell's son owned Mirrorsoft, Kevin Maxwell. And he was the preferred of the companies. So Mirrorsoft's deal with Atari would stand. We got those sweet Blasteroid rights, baby. And um, Jim, though, agreed to let Hank Rogers have the PC rights for Japan better than nothing. All of this is built on lies by Robert Stein. This is still happening. This is a house of cards at the moment. Uh, Because he has the rights to computer games, which he thinks is like, fuck it, everything's a computer. And it's not. Uh, there's going to be more wording on that in a Semantics, bit. Semantics, baby. So Rogers did want more rights to get rights. That was a sloppy chain of command. Robert Stein and his company Andromeda Software licensed Tetris for the West and Far East markets for the Soviet Union. Just a recap. Stein flipped those rights to Mirosoft and sister company Spectrum Holobyte, both owned by UK media mogul Robert Maxwell. Mirror had Mirrorsoft had resold various rights, including Japanese PC rights to Hank Rogers. They sold arcade rights to Tengen. Tengen planned on selling the home console versions in the U.S., but also they sold the Japanese rights to Sega for arcade machines and to Hank Rogers for home consoles. It's a mess. Rogers managed to acquire the Famicom rights, though, in Japan from Tengen under strict requirements. They had to get get everything approved at, in like by Russia. Russia wants to see the finished products to verify what's going on. And they were told that they did. They're like, Russia approved this. Someone uh, must have gone from Rogers to Spectrum Hall or to Atari. At some point, Robert Stein just like threw something in the garbage and said, yeah, sure. They, they would, they'd love it if they saw it. I'm sure we're fine. They've only been upset and, uh, mad at everything put out about the game so far so surely they'll be psyched with whatever he's got and the more people find out about it in russia the worse it gets yeah it's not gonna be insulting at all but in the depths of r&d one in japan gunpei yokoi was working up something mean it was gonna change the dna of gaming what is it dylan it's called the game boy it's called the game boy Gunpei Yokoi was a prolific engineer who started as a simple assembly line mechanic before creating some of the most important pieces of Nintendo technology. Game Boy would be stripped down to the most basic components. Monochromatic screen, four AA batteries, much more inexpensive than competition, which... Uh, Hundo dollars back then. Yeah, compared to which what... Which inflates to about 160 to 170 today. Yeah, uh, way cheaper than what the competitors were doing. Oh, yeah. For like much more clunky technology, elegance, simplicity. But also, if you didn't get the clear one, you're a loser. Are you talking about the Game Boy Color? The Game Boy. They had, they had a clear version of the original Game yeah. Boy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I had it. I like the original gray one that's got white all over it. That's yeah, slowly... I love I love the I love the intense discoloration. It looks like it was that in a smoker's turns house. Yellow, like over the course yeah, of time. I love that. Well, that's like the, what happens with the Nintendo, too. It's just the plastic that they used. Yeah, I've, I've been seeing a lot about people's Wii U's getting, uh, like, the sticks are starting to re I'm not liking that. Yeah. Are you people, it too? Yeah, people are saying, like, the Wii U is starting to, like, brick itself, too. Yeah, they're bricking now. You have to play it once every, like, year in order to keep it alive. That's scary. Damn. But Yamauchi personally approves every game, every product Nintendo puts out. He personally approves it. And he saw the Game Boy approved immediately, and he says, "Well, we're going to sell at least 25 million units within a few years. No reason not to ramp up production, get it moving." Minoru Arakawa, Yamauchi's son-in-law, was the president of Nintendo of America. He oversaw Nintendo's introduction to the U.S. He pulled in a junior engineer named Shigeru Miyamoto to retrofit old arcade machines, creating Donkey Kong. The best version of Donkey Kong is on the Game Boy. Yeah, yeah. Yep, I've heard that. I haven't played through the whole thing, but I've heard it's really good. There are like extra levels and it's insane. A lot of extra levels. It's really good. But Arakawa saw the Game Boy and he immediately claimed this is going to sell at least 100 million units. This is going to be a big fucking deal. Mm -hmm. But you need the perfect software to pack with this thing. Mm -hmm. The perfect thing that'll sell the system as, you know, 
And you'd think Mario. We're going to put Mario on there, right? Mario's our, our biggest thing. They did make Mario Land. But not as a packing title. No. Now, Hank Rogers in 1988 uh, saw the Game Boy for the first time. He was one of the first people to get to see the Game Boy in R&D 1. And he knew immediately Tetris is what you want on there. Uh, everybody can play Tetris. Everybody loves Tetris. Yep. It's cross-cultural. It doesn't need a manual. There are families I know of that own a Game Boy. And the only game they have for it is Tetris. This would become a problem for Nintendo yes, because the number of people that bought their <clears throat> hardware and didn't buy another fucking game after Tetris, yep. uh, you make most of your margin selling software. Yes, you want to sell your hardware at a slim profit or potentially a loss. Uh, I mean, even the consoles today, they sell for a loss because there's the only way they're making money is off of digital sales really at this point. Uh, the physical sales a little bit, but digital they're lowering the cost of manu manufacturing and they're just getting it right the fuck out there. So, I mean, the fact that I buy a lot digital now, unless I want to share with you guys or I'm drunk at 3 a.m. and I really want to download Sonic Frontiers. Uh, <laughs> That's the only way I buy digital too now. Yeah. It's, it's like, like I'm a like little a fucked up and I'm like, there's a sale. Yeah. You want to play something immediately? It's, you can. Yeah. yeah. The, I bought The Last of Us Remastered on a whim. And then the morning after, I was like, fuck, I spent $70 last night. But at least I get to play the remaster. Yeah. Arakawa, though, was hesitant to put an obscure puzzle game as the pack-in. But uh, Rogers insisted this would break through to new audiences outside of children. I think Wario's Woods really could have penetrated the market. <laughs> yeah, penetrated you. Yeah, I'd let him. Probably smells like garlic. Hey. Um, hey. <laughs> but yes, uh... It would break through to audiences outside of just children gamers. Something that Nintendo would become very known for is yeah. pushing boundaries and getting out there into a new market. And Arakawa and the R&D actually had been considering Tetris uh, before this, but they, after seeing Hank Rogers' conviction, they're like, this is probably right. So we're going to introduce ourselves to another person here, Howard Lincoln, a, a Nintendo's attack dog lawyer. He was the one who saved Donkey Kong from Universal Studios and because Universal Studios sued them with mm -hmm. Donkey Kong, said it was uh, infringing on King Kong. They're like, fuck you, dude. That was the whole lawsuit, I think. I don't know. He's got up. Your Honor, fuck you. Did they rule it as parody? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it was parody, but I think it was also like RKO had the rights. Or like they, they didn't even own the rights to King Kong, really. It was like somebody they were just else. making King Kong movies. So literally, it was like when someone makes a Robin Hood movie, it's like, you don't own Robin Hood. Yeah. Like, it's it, the rights lapsed, essentially. Yeah. But um, Eric Kawa and Howard Lincoln knew that they wanted the Tetris rights and they knew something was fucky with them. So Lincoln was put in charge of figuring out what was going on here. And they knew the answers would be in the USSR. They had no fucking clue what was going on behind the Iron Curtain, so Lincoln formulated a plan. We're going to send an outsider in there. They're going to have to navigate the waters because they won't have the right visa. They don't know where the buildings are. They could get in big trouble if they get caught. Who's going to go? Hank Rogers. Uh, if He was the guy that they chose to go in on this mission to acquire Tetris rights out from a lot of people that wanted them. Uh, before they could get their hands on him. And if he was successful, Hank Rogers' company, Bulletproof Software, would be sub-licensed the Tetris rights for Game Boy, and he would receive a cut of every cartridge sold. Essentially, if this Woof. mission goes well, Hank Rogers is set. Woof. He's got generational wealth. He is He is set. And at this point, we're going to make a, a quick introduction to Nikolai Belikov. Uh, he is the new person in charge of negotiations for Alorg. He is... Uh, looks like the thing he negotiates by not talking and being just that classic, like big Russian dude that you don't fuck around with. You mean Benjamin J. Grimm? Yeah, he's like, he's the thing. He, he just, he scours and he just looks disapproving. And there's guys with guns standing behind him. It's an intimidating conversation. Sure. Uh, so he's in charge of the negotiations for the opening volley at the end of 1988. Rogers sent a message to Robert Stein regarding the portable rights. No one had portable rights to this thing yet. And uh, Rogers was surprised when Stein didn't say yes immediately. 
especially since they had offered $25,000 in advance, which was a lot of money. Uh, Stein contacted Jim and said that all inquiries, uh, Jim McNockany, the in charge of Mirasoft, and he says, anyone inquiring about portable rights, uh, don't sell them. We need to just hold on to these because it might be a big market. Hmm. He, also, I don't have the rights to sell these. But Stein didn't say that to anybody. This dude is just wheeling and dealing. Stein was no longer in contact with Alexinko, the Russian who would gleefully come to Paris and drink wine with you and negotiate. Now he's dealing with Belikov. And Belikov is like... He's not going to France to drink wine. No. no. If you drink vodka with him, you are in good graces, but you have to get on Belikov's real good side to get anywhere like that. Uh, so the USSR was definitely starting to notice how almost no money had come in for Tetris at all with what they had licensed out. Because according to the deal, all the other profits go this way, and then a portion of the remainder gets sent to Russia. Tetris arcade machines around the world weren't actually covered by any deal with Andromeda and Alorg. No coin-op deal had ever happened. And Stein's uh, response, Robert Stein's response to Jim raised alarms to uh, Mirosoft as well. They're like, I think Stein is fucking up. We don't trust him, and he's being really sketchy. So they realize he might not have the rights. And Kevin Maxwell was uh, chosen to go and try and go into Russia to get the rights for portables and to figure out what was going on. So so what would have happened the, if these guys were caught? Like, well, well, we don't know for sure, but Kevin Maxwell was invited there. Robert Stein was invited there. Hank Rogers was not invited. So if Hank got caught, we're talking like probably thrown in jail, prison interrogated sort of thing. It's it's a situation where he is not using the correct visa. He's asking questions that are not allowed by foreigners. And he is trying to do very illegal business uh, in the USSR when that shit just opened up and it's the sketchiest place, though. Would it be far-fetched to say that he put his life on the line then? No. Big time. Um, one wrong word to the wrong person, he could just be thrown into sketchy prison. And he's American, correct? Hank Rogers, uh, Dutch. Dutch. But lived in America, lived in Japan, a uh, very multicultural person. But he's going to stick out a little bit. He's in there speaking English for a Japanese company. Damn. That yeah. is ballsy as fuck. And he has a big mustache. Yeah, that big, big mustache energy. Well, the big mustache probably helped him out there. Yeah, they, like, people saw the mustache and they're oh, like, "He's man. He's, he's man. He's big man. He's got the big burly chest." And then you have to you have to drink vodka with them. And if you can not cough, then they know you're cool. And you can't do that thing where you like, Ugh, you know, you get the shivers. If you ask for a Mountain Dew chaser, they know you're not legit. <laughs> <laughs> can I get the PBR chaser, please? Do you have anything else? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and a little bit about the nature of the Maxwells, uh, Robert Maxwell and Kevin Maxwell. Uh, you know, he's like a Rupert Murdoch type big figure. And he was in very well with Gorbachev. So Kevin Maxwell was invited to these meetings as well as Robert Stein. Hank Rogers was not, however. But they were all in the race. And the meetings for Maxwell and Stein were within two weeks of when Rogers showed up. And it was very fucking close. It was like this microcosm of time where a lot of stuff happened. And that movie about this comes out in two weeks. Yeah. I am fucking jacked right now. Yeah, dude. The, the trailer is very good. I'm excited. Are they going to play it I'm gonna the watch. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, it's on Apple Plus. <laughs> if you want to know what happens into these three negotiators, you'll have to turn in for, tune in for part two of the Tetris story on April 19th. Now, if you're a member of our Patreon, you'd have access to this episode right away. But, uh, yep, if you're interested, just go to patreon.com slash hear the dog cast for the $3 tier. You get access to episodes way in advance and access to our discord. There's a lot of other great tiers and bonus podcasts as well. But, uh, otherwise, yes, part two, where we will conclude this amazing story will be April 19th. And we hope you join us for that. And if you can't wait, check us out on Patreon. This has been Raw Dogs. We are part of the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Special thanks to executive producers. We have Brian Ward, Ryan Kristinek, Kip Kipper. My wife. We have Jordan <laughs> Hoff, and we have 
Phil. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for supporting us the executive producer range. You can reach out to us at hairthedogcast at gmail.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. Join our Discord. Yeah, Discord's a lot of fun. And to do that, just go to patreon.com slash hairthedogcast. You get access to part two of this episode immediately. Uh, also, for uh, at the $10 tier, you get access to Dylan Dews hits on the, the, the planes. Join us on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs>